we turn to... Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, I'd like to make three points. The first point is that I think we all agree that there's a synchronized slowdown and with the potential that we might have a recession. And there are minefield of triggers. There are all these geopolitical factors. Anything can trigger uh, some of the economy, pushing some of the economy into the recession. My question number one is that how can you cope with it? Uh, do we have a right tools to cope with that? You wanted to talk about monetary game and the basically monetary is losing its effectiveness and there's a good chance that when you, you know, lower your interest further and further down with the easy monetary policy, actually you create a big debt bomb down the road and there's a good possibility that we might end up financing the garbage project. For all of those things, we're going to pay the price. My more concern is on the fiscal policy. Yesterday, I guess Oliver Blanchard mentioned that you know, because monetary policy is tied up in many countries, uh, fiscal might be the only game with the low interest rate. But with all this populism rising in many countries, everybody, particularly populist uh, politicians, are trying to win the election. And with a slowly growing or sometimes decreasing uh, pie, I guess most of the fiscal policy run the risk of ending up uh, just give away rather than uh, spending in the more productive sectors or facilitate the structural investment. And the third thing is that during the you know, 2008 crisis, we have a global coordination. We all remember G20 played a very instrumental role. I remember that in 2009 in Seoul G20, all the leaders agreed to uh, stand still and roll back of all protectionist measures. And that helped a lot to avoid the worst outcome of the 2008 crisis. Now we don't have it. And we conveniently say, you know, so-called new normal about this low interest rate and all of the stuff. But I don't think we can hide it behind this new normal about lack of international coordination. And this is very worrisome, particularly for countries in Asia. Because you know, Asia has been following up globalization, and then we had a crisis 20 years ago with all this capital flow. And then we recovered, and no, 10 years ago, we have this global financial crisis. But now, the question is that if the global coordination or the role of G20 is no longer there, if we have a crisis, where can you rely on? And fortunately, I'm very happy to tell that we have made a lot of progress. Uh, since the two, 20 years ago crisis, we have created something called, right now they call it RFA, Regional Financial Arrangements. Europe has ESM, Asia has come up with something called the CMIM. Basically, it's a multilateral swap between ASEAN 10 countries and Japan, Korea, China. Uh, even though it's a work in the progress, we have made a lot of progress. But uh, at the same time, there are many missing uh, blocks, missing links in terms of the paid in capital, because it's all promises, but there's no actual paid in capital, for example. And we don't know how to coordinate once the crisis hits us between IF, IMF and this regional financial arrangements and many bilateral swaps. So this is also a big concern for many Asian countries. And finally, uh, I just want to mention that you know, there's something called, we agreed under the G20, capital flow measures for macroprudential purpose. And in Korea's case, uh, in 2008 crisis, even though we had almost no exposure to US house mortgage market, and we, had, we are sitting on a pretty big amount of uh, reserve at the time, 20, $260 billion. Still, because we have a, a relatively large short-term debt, we are hit by the international investors. There was a pullout of money. It was the only when we entered with the Federal Reserve uh, swapping range of $30 billion that the hemorrhage stopped. But actually, when you look at it, this short-term debt is not a really short-term debt. The large chunk of it is fictional debt. It's uh, sort of, a, I don't want to be too technical, but it's a, a forward sell position of a foreign banks in Korea. So after that, we implemented two measures. Basically, we charge the bank levy. And you know, if it's a less than one year borrowing, in the, during the inflow stage, they have to pay additional 
10 basis point. And another thing is that all those derivative positions should be linked and limited by the capital base. And with these two measures, what we found out is that the capital inflow does not change in terms of the amount, but basically the structure changed. So it's much more longer term. It's much more stable. And this kind of you know, capital flow measures for prudential, macroprudential purposes, I guess it should be more encouraged and explored. Uh, IMF is much more positive on that, or it is a little bit uh, hesitant to, toward that, but I think you know, this is something without global coordination particularly, we have to uh, explore more. And finally about this, you know, we mentioned about this resetting of capitalism, and because of this perception or actual happening of inequality, I agree that we gotta do something about it. But what we found out is that we have an, now a little left-leaning government which emphasizes a lot about justice, fairness, equality. But it's all great in, in, in saying it as a cause, but when you try to implement it, you have this nightmare, who will define justice, who will define fairness? And so all these good intentions often end up with pretty bad results. As they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I'm not saying the efforts is not worthwhile, but rather what I'm trying to point out, the, the risk, particularly on the populism, and trying to address this inequality issue, you try to push too far, and how to find the right equilibrium uh, is it something we have to all struggle in each country. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. A lot of uh, potential questions for you in the discussion. On the